But it was reported today, it's at the top of Drudge all day in world news from the Daily Beast, that the Obama administration stabbed Israel in the back. That the sanctions on Iran were softened in June, even before the current round of nuclear talks in Geneva began. They've already yielded. So they've entered a, a, a game of chess, and they've already lost five rounds before they started. Did they lose, or did they do what Valerie Jarrett, born in Iran, wanted? What did I just say? Valerie Jarrett, her, his most trusted advisor, is Iranian? You betcha. You betcha. Now, of course, that wouldn't color her any more than uh, someone born in Israel working in Chicago would uh, color his views in any way. But apparently, uh, Kerry is working overtime to stab, not only stab Israel in the back, the knife's already in the back of Netanyahu, but to twist the knife now. So I'll ask you, the audience, I realize it's very difficult to ask you anything on a Friday night. It's always an uphill battle. How do you feel about Obama stabbing Israel in the back? Do you care? Is this of any interest to you or what? I'll repeat the story. Daily Beast. Long before a nuclear deal was in reach, the U.S. was lifting some of the financial pressure on Iran. A Daily Beast investigation reveals how the sanctions were softened. If we don't want to talk about that, what else is there to talk about? It's probably the biggest story of the week. As someone wrote, sounds like Obama decided to enter the Persian nuclear bazaar to haggle with the masters of negotiation. Does that interest you at all? Is that an interesting topic for talk radio? Or would you rather I talk about depression? Or how about a meatball recipe? Uh, this is a big story. I realize it didn't. All right, well, then we'll go on to hair lice. That's all. I'll do a story on hair lice. That might be of interest to the uh, American political audience today. Is this what you get from drinking too much tea? Unless I say something about a tea party, you can't respond because... Are you crazy? You don't realize how big this story is? Okay, here, I'll do a lice story then. More lenient school lice policies bug some parents. That's the benign headline. Uh, did you hear what went on now? Parents are scratching their heads over less restrictive head lice policies that allow children with live bugs in their hair to return to the classroom. Do you know why they're doing that? And some school nurses are no longer sending home the dreaded lice note to other parents with kids in the classroom, alerting them to the possibility of lice in their own child's precious hair. Why? It's to prevent the children with lice in the hair from being embarrassed and to protect their privacy. I'm not making this up. We're living in the end days of insanity. America is in the final throes of psychosis under Obama. The policy shift is designed to help children not be embarrassed uh, who have lice in their hair. So although it may uh, result in the infection, the louse infection, spreading to other children, that's not as important as the self-esteem of the lousy children. Did you hear what I just said, lousy children? You know where the word lousy person comes from? It's people who have lice in their hair. Now, I'll remind those of you who are ignoramuses out there, which would ha probably be in the 98th percentile of America, uh, that lice can transmit many serious illnesses, infections rather, including typhus. But since lice have now become somewhat prevalent as a result of unchecked immigration from the third world, we don't want to upset you because you certainly would rather... Look, a good liberal would say, I'd rather my child come home with louse in her, lice in her hair than embarrass an illegal alien. Now I'll tie that into the next story about illegal alien. Berkeley has banned the term illegal immigrant in its discourse because the phrase is racist, offensive, unfair, and derogatory. In a unanimous vote, the moronic student senators passed a resolution that stated the word illegal is racially charged, dehumanizes people, and contributes to punitive and discriminatory actions aimed primarily at immigrants and communities of color. Well, I suggest that we go along with the UC Berkeley student government and not use the words illegal immigrants. So we'll use the word illegal alien from now on, since that's a legalistic term that is absolutely correct. They're illegal and they're aliens. I'll go on now. Do we have any calls on any of this? If not, I'll, uh, we can go to a best of. I mean, I'm not going to do anything else. Israel's the big story to me. Do we have this, uh, uh, any uh, sound of John Kerry? Of course we do. Let's go to clip number one on the Savage Nation. The P5 is doing some very important work right now. And uh, I'm delighted to be here at the invitation of Kathy Ashton 
uh, to try to work with our colleagues to see if we can narrow some differences. I want to emphasize there are still some very important uh, issues on the table that are unresolved. Now, no one knows what P5 is, and no one knows who Kathy Ashton is. This shows you how disconnected uh, John Kerry is from reality, from the real world. No one knows who P5 is. I never heard of it. I don't know who Kathy Ashton is. Does she own a clothing line? What is he talking about? He's talking about basically cutting Israel's throat now that he stabbed him in the back. What do you mean he's working with your colleagues? You have colleagues in Iran that we don't know about? Who are they? Colleagues of uh, Valerie Jarrett? So do you know what I'm talking about? Well, listen to clip two. I want to emphasize there is not an agreement at this point in time. Uh, but the P5 is working hard. And I look forward to the meetings that I'll be having very shortly uh, with, uh, with uh, Lady Kathy Ashton uh, and with my fellow ministers in the P5. And then also uh, I will be meeting with Minister Zarif. Minister Zarif, the Minister of Death. And I still don't know what the P5 is, and I don't know who Lady Kathy Ashton is, nor do I give a rat's... I don't give a lice. A Berkeley louse doesn't interest me. A, a louse in the hair of a student in Berkeley interests me more than someone by the name of Lady Kathy Ashton. When I hear the name Lady Kathy Ashton, I get nauseated. Now, this meeting is, of, of course, very great importance to us because it means that not since Jimmy Peanut Carter did what he did, back in the days of the disaster of uh, the peanut administration, have we seen anything as uh, deadly with such deadly incompetence? But I'm asking you a question. How do you feel about Obama stabbing Israel in the back? Now, I know many Israel, uh, excuse me, many uh, um, liberals in America, in, in fact, even Jewish liberals will say, I feel good about them stabbing Israel in the back. I like it. Jewish liberals across America are probably cheering that Israel got stabbed in the back because they support Obama and uh, Kerry and the Democrats to a 90th percentile. They hate the Tea Party, which supports Israel. So I would think the Jewish liberals are celebrating tonight in synagogues across America that uh, Obama and Kerry stabbed Israel in the back going back to June. They certainly haven't changed their politics. The synagogues haven't changed their position, which is anything Obama does is good because he is God. So I'll ask you again. I'll ask you until you finally answer, because I'm not stopping. How do you feel about Obama stabbing Israel in the back? Because that's what he did. Listen to what Mr. Netanyahu said in clip three. I met Secretary Kerry right before he leaves uh, to Geneva. I reminded him that he said, no deal is better than a bad deal. And the deal that is being uh, discussed in Geneva right now is a bad deal. It's a very bad deal. Iran is not required to take apart even one centrifuge. See? So now here, clip four, you'll hear the rest of the story on the Savage Nation. Iran gets everything that it wanted at this stage, and it pays nothing. And this is when Iran is under severe pressure. I urge Secretary Kerry not to rush to sign, to wait, to reconsider, to get a good deal. But this is a bad deal, a very, very bad deal. It's the deal of the century for Iran. It's a very dangerous and bad deal for peace and the international community. Now, if it was only Israel saying this, many of you will say, good, I'm glad. Who's Israel to push us around, and why should the tail wag the dog? But I'll remind you that uh, Saudi Arabia is equally incensed by Kerry and Obama signing a secret deal with Iran, just so you get the, the big picture, okay? Just so you don't think it's only Israel. That would be bad enough, but you could say, all right, who cares about Israel? I'm sick of them. They're a bunch of greedy, pushy people who I don't care about. I'm sick of the dog, the tail wagging the dog. Let them, you know, let them, let them screw themselves already. Many people feel that way, by the way, about Israel, except for the Christian conservative movement in America, which has been marginalized by this communist regime. But I will remind you that Saudi Arabia is also anguished over this. So who is Obama answering to by doing the secret deal with Iran is the question. This is only one man's opinion. You can dismiss it if you wish. After all, who am I to make an opinion? Who am I to have an opinion when I'm just a talk show host? Now, of course, I began the week by warning you not to take the flu vaccine. And uh, although it was posted on Drudge for me, it was a year ago. It got 900,000 hits or a million hits. I don't know how many. 
And what, what you, why believe me? Why, what are you listening to him for? Go to your local doctor, your AMA doctor. He knows everything. Ask the doctor. He knows. Well, strange, a story came out today that said a Johns Hopkins scientist slams the, the flu vaccine. And where was it published? Wait a minute. Savage said it on Monday. It can't be true. A Johns Hopkins scientist has issued a blistering report on influence of vaccines in the British Medical Journal. Wow. The BMJ confirms what Savage said. And I'm only a talk show host, merely with an epidemiology and uh, human nutrition PhD from the University of California. And I was right. How could that be? He's a conservative. He's a right winger. What does he know? Who knows? Who knows what he knows? But the big topic is not the flu vaccine. If you want the fa vaccine and you don't, you know what I think you should do if you're a liberal? Get two flu vaccines. Get two. Take one. Get one free. Take an extra one for me. Do me a favor. If every Democrat in America took two flu vaccine shots, we might actually have a sane nation at the end of the year. I won't finish why, but you can figure that one out. No, they're so safe. Take two of them. In fact, take three of them because I'm wrong about everything. You should take three flu vaccine shots if you're a Democrat. And conservatives shouldn't take one. Now, there's another story today that I haven't yet told you about. He fired two more generals, two, two admirals now. He did it tonight. It came out tonight in the Washington Post at the last minute. He fired two more. The man is purging the military of everyone who might stand up to him. Two U.S. admirals, including the director of naval intelligence, were dismissed tonight. Placed on leave Friday night, and their access to classified material was suspended. Again, obviously on trumped-up charges by the master of the purge. The greatest purge since, since uh, Joseph Stalin did it is going on right in front of your nose, but because we have a gelded press, look it up. It's another word that you may not have heard of, like mulk the public. I'll be right back. Joining us right now is a great guest. He's been on twice before this year. Everyone loves him. Walid Shobat, former Muslim Brotherhood member, member of the PLO, former terrorist. He wrote a book called The Case for Islamophobia. The Case for Islamophobia. You can read his work at shubat.com. Walid, welcome back to the program on this crazy night. Welcome to the Savage Nation. Oh, I pressed the wrong button. Walid, welcome to the program. Walid. So, Walid, I read the news this morning on Drudge. I was stunned that Obama had been negotiating with the mullahs in June? <laughs> well, of course, you know, this is going to leave Iran with the capacity to build nuclear weapons. A total suspension of uranium enrichment, by the way, doesn't seem to be in the cards in this negotiation in Geneva. At best, a commitment, which is a false promise from the Iranians who are Islamists and by nature they practice taqiyya, the limited enrichment will just slow down work. At when you, when you said something which I understand, but my listeners didn't. You said they're Islamists and they practice, did you say taqiyya? Taqiyya, yes. It's, which means you can, you can lie to an infidel to get your way. Is that what that means? That is correct. The Shia... Is, is, is that why Obama practices that methodology? Uh, well, uh, Obama is uh, originally Sunni. Sunnis practice what is called muruna. Muruna is to be stealth, is to sanction prohibitions for a detrimental time period in order to gain concessions. And that's practiced by the Muslim Brotherhood. The spirit head of the Muslim Brotherhood, Sheikh Yusuf al-Qaradawi, instituted this practice. But that's what Obama just practiced against John Boehner and the Republicans. Well, yes, I believe, as I mentioned before in your program. So he, lear he learned well. He learned well. He learned his techniques, his negotiation tactics beat that of the Russians. There used to be a thing in, in business negotiations called the Rus Russian method, which is first you get what you want and then you raise the stakes and ask for more. But this seems to be a new level of negotiation. Right. Let's not forget, you know, Valerie Garrett, she's his assistant. She's born in Iran, and let's not forget her father-in-law and Barack Obama's mentor, Frank Marshall Davis, were colleagues in Chicago. So there is influence from within his own Do you understand that Valerie Jarrett plays a prominent role in all of his, executive, all of his decisions? Uh, do you think her Iranian uh, ancestry has anything to do with it? 
Well, yes. I mean, let's, let's not even forget, even when you talk about Iran itself, you know, you have Hassan Rouhani, who's the president of Iran. He's Aziri Turk, which means that when the West thinks that they could thwart the Sunni uh, rising to power by basically aiding Iran, well, you have an alliance between Turkey and Iran because of the Aziri connection. Uh, these religious leaders of Iran are, are um, uh, all Aziri Turks. So we have to understand the makeup of the Muslim world before we... Well, I, you know, I heard that from an Iranian who's very proud of his heritage, who's, who escaped the mullahs in the se late 70s, who said that, um, uh, I, um, what's his name, the last president, the one who kept saying Israel should die and we'll kill them all. Ahmad I forget. I, I kept, he kept saying he was a Turk. Is that true? Yeah, Aziri Turks. That's correct. And they, well, wh wh how did they take over Iran, this, this branch of the Turkish people? Well, in the 11th century, they moved to Central Asia, the Oguz Turks, that is, and began to build, to make prominent power. And they are a minority in Iran. Nevertheless, they're a major voting bloc in Iran. This is why the religious institution are Aziri Turks. And this is why Turkey has interfered in the past in regarding the enrichment of uranium in Iran and had stated to the world to, to hands off Iran because they'll take care of the whole issue. Of course, there, in the future, once there is a Shia crescent, in other words, once Iran builds its nuclear weapons, which I've been arguing for years, this will build the power peg of Iran into Iraq. Iraq is majority Shia. Syria is ruled by a Shia government. And then you have also Hezbollah in Lebanon, that will be the threat to the northern borders of Israel, but it is not inconceivable to have a Sunni alliance with Shia in Iran, because Hamas in the past have allied with Hezbollah against Israel. So this whole idea of basically balancing the power between Shia and Sunni will not work, because they could ally. And if they do ally, and Iran has nuclear weapons, that threatens also Saudi Arabia. And by the way, Saudi Arabia is currently... Uh, already have ordered their nuclear bomb from Pakistan. They're working on a nuclear bomb, so which means the armament of the Middle East will continue uh, as a result of what Barack Obama is doing with the Iranians. And by that, Saudi Arabia feels more threatened than Israel even. That's what I said at the beginning, Waleed. You speak Arabic and you know what they write and say in their home countries, but what I read in the English language literature today is that the Saudis are more freaked out by this backstabbing by Obama than the Israelis are. That is absolutely correct. The, Shi the, the Saudi government is more afraid of Iran than anything else. The Shia Sunni divide between if Saudi Arabia and Iran has historic connection in which the Sunnis have always assassinated imams in the past. And of course, the mi most major threat to Saudi Arabia is, is, is Iran, Persia. And so, you know, there goes the oil issue, uh, there goes the entire Middle East. So why is Obama secretly uh, aiding and abetting the arrival of this pan, this pan uh, Arabism across the Middle East, or if you want to call it uh, the Crescent, the Shia Crescent? Well, I mean, why, is he do why is he doing this? Well, I mean, Obama, in my view, has always been culturally Muslim. We can discuss this if he doesn't agree with me. But you can see his alliance with his own family. Malik Obama, his brother, works for the Sudanese government. He is the official employee of the Sudanese terror state. He works as the executive director uh, of the Dawa organization of the government of Sudan. And he's very well connected with his family. So it is not far-fetched. In fact... His brother is the elder of the family. In other words, culturally speaking, Obama must obey his brother in, in a culture setting, that is. And he's been given, uh, you know, latitude for, with the IRS. He runs a polygamy compound in Kenya. He works very closely with the terrorist infrastructure of Sudan. Obama does not like his brother, George Otieno, because of his Christian mother. These things Americans don't even look into. But Amazing. it's a fact. It's that amazing. Obama is very close-knit, connected with his Sunni family, and they are very much Islamist. They work with the Wahhabists. We've done an entire research on the Obama family. His We're speaking with a man who knows much more than I do about the subject, but the main topic today for the average American audience listening in cars and homes around the country, perhaps on uh, the Internet, is that we learned today 
that your hero, the hero of liberalism, the hero of Jewish America, uh, the hero of the Democrat machine, Barack Obama, has stabbed Israel in the back. They lifted Iran's sanctions month ago. months ago. Iran is on the way to a nuclear weapon. Israel now has very few options left. And we're speaking with a man who reads and speaks Arabic, Walid Shabbat. And he's a member today of civilized, of the civilized world, but he wasn't always there. Former Muslim Brotherhood member. Weren't you a member of the, of the PLO, Walid? Yes, at first. Then when in the States, I was in the States, I was a member of the Muslim Brotherhood. In fact, my mentor was a colleague of Abdullah Azzam, who's the godfather of Al-Qaeda. So we understand how to infiltrate the West, sort of like Captain Spock and you, Captain Kirk. And Captain Kirk doesn't usually understand how the alien world works, not meaning you, but the American people. In <laughs> they don't understand anything. All the average American knows is what the sports scores are. Well, he, what a nation. What a nation. How else could this unknown, uh, unex inexperienced senator who got there by accident as a senator have become president other than we're a nation of, of morons? Absolutely. Uh, I'm sorry, Walid. I have contempt for my own fellow citizens. They got the leadership they deserve, but it's he's got three more years, Walid, and he's just done perhaps the most transparent thing he could ever do to show what he really thinks of Israel and the Jewish state, and yet the Jewish voices in America are silent today. Absolutely. In fact, Israel's security uh, needs to act on its own. Israel only has one remaining course, and that is to exercise its military option against Iran. But how could they exercise a military option when the United States is negotiating with Iran and having this Geneva Agreement? So it becomes, you know, Israel will begin to look like a pariah uh, and a warmonger if and when it attacks the nuclear facility. Israel had an opportunity years ago, but they failed to act upon it. Yes. Fear of insulting the Americans. Yes. So if Israel does what they say they've been doing for years now, we're going to do, which is we have to attack, we have to attack, we have to attack. Now Obama lifts the sanctions without getting anything back from Iran. Do you actually think Israel will attack? Because I don't think they will. No, impossible. They will not attack uh, for many reasons. That is, they will not get the support of the U.S., number one. Number two... The centrifuges are many and underground, and without the aid of the United States, it's a, it's a very much a difficult mission. And, uh, you know, they have also Saudi Arabia is in the mix. Uh, so it, in my view, it will end up as a showdown between Saudi Arabia and Iran, in which Saudi Arabia will end up being the loser. I believe in the future Saudi Arabia will get nuked by Iran, and Gee. this will happen, and they will be a huge problem. So well, uh, well, let's pause. That's a heck of a this statement. For many years. Waleed, let me ask you something. During the Hajj, isn't the Hajj open to all sects or the two major, the, the only sects I know of Islam are Sunni and Shia? It's open to both. Isn't that correct, the Hajj, the pilgrimage? That is correct, but it doesn't mean there's no problems that the Shiites have caused in the past, even in Mecca itself. At one point in time, the Saudis had to kind of poison gas the demonstrators and kill many Shiite demonstrators. In fact, even in Iran, they tried to build their own Kaaba. So, oh, my God. This That's a big story unto itself. This is awesome, Wally. You know what amazes me? Each time you're on this sh show of mine, The Savage Nation, you and I think like we're brothers or cousins. It's astounding. I mean, I'm just speaking out loud. I'm thinking out loud. I don't have a script. You are also brazen enough to use your brains publicly, which is amazing. But we come to the same conclusions. How is that possible when we come from such dif different backgrounds? Why is that? Well, because we have a similar spiritual fountain. When, you become, when I become a Christian, I go to the Torah. I go to the Old Testament. I revere the Old Testament. I revere the laws of Moses. I begin to understand I don't have to give my life or my son's life for the sake of Allah. That in Christianity, God gave his son already to save my life and my son's life. So the, the, the fountain is the Judeo-Christian ethics, which, by the way, uh, needs to begin to argue its supremacy in the world. Let's not, uh, not forget, it is impossible to negotiate with Iran. 
because in, in the Islamic concept, the Quran says, "Kuntum khayra ummatin ukhrijat linnas." You were the most favored of all people. In, in other words, the Muslims are superior to non-Muslims. We need to start thinking in the same way and in the same wavelengths to say Judeo-Christian ethics are superior, and we need to thwart the Islamic superiority by our own code of ethics, which we are not exercising in the West. We seem to, th- to think that equality of religion is the way. But in the ancient times, there was no religious equality amongst Christendom. It has to be the superiority of the Judeo-Christian ethics. And this is the problem in the West. Yes, because the West has basically turned into a, an apologetic, liberal na- um, uh, entity that is apologizing for its, for its uh, so-called ethics. Around the globe, Christianity is apologetic rather than, let us say, celebratory about what it has given the world. It dwells only on the negatives, not on the positives. But that's a topic for another day. When I come back with Walid Shobat, which, Shubat, sorry, Walid, uh, it's very important people go to your website, shubat.com, S-H-O-E-B-A-T.com. Read his book, He Was a Muslim, called The Case for Islamophobia. Walid is here. Unfortunately, we, if we have an open line, I'll leave one or two open lines. I don't know what people could ask that I'm not going to ask or you're not going to say. When I come back, Walid, what I'd like to touch on is I want to go beyond this issue of Iran getting a nuclear weapon, which seems to be what Obama has decided will happen and get nothing in exchange. I want to ask you what you think about the bigger, the bigger threat, in my opinion, which is the lawless nation of Pakistan which has, what, 30 nuclear weapons already? Oh, uh, some assume 100 nuclear weapons. We don't know for... 100 nuclear weapons in a basically lawless nation called Pakistan. And what the chances are of Pakistan launching against us, Israel, or one of our allies, either directly or through a terrorist organization. I'll be right back. Well, Israel may reject it all at once, but... Iran is the big winner here. Obama has thrown in with the Iranians. He has basically eased sanctions, even though, of course, he's lying uh, through Kerry and saying that we haven't really uh, you know, lifted the sanctions. It came out today in the Daily Beast that as of June, they were already lifting sanctions against Iran, which were the only things that kept Iran somewhat in line, and now it's over. A review of Treasury Department notices reveals that the U.S. government has all but stopped the financial blacklisting of entities and people that help Iran evade international sanctions since the election of its president, Hassan Rouhani, in June. What's interesting to me is there's a TV show called Homeland, which is so remarkable in so many ways, and it's about a, uh, a U.S. congressman who really is an agent of um, al-Qaeda. It's also about, the current episode is about a banker who is on the side of Iran running their, their money laundering, and what he will do in his duplicitous ways to make certain that Iran continues to uh, evade the sanctions. But now we have no need for such shows, do we? There's an open love affair with Iran under Obama. Joining us again is our great guest, Walid Shubat, former Muslim Brotherhood member. He knows more than you do. He knows much more than you do, you doubting Thomases. Go to Shubat.com. Walid, so we both agreed in the last segment that Israel will not act we, we pretty much know they can't. Isn't that correct? That is absolutely correct. Okay. Israel will not act. The U.S. certainly said it's not going to act. So where does that leave Iran? Between you and I, they're not crazy. They're not going to suddenly start bombing Israel, are they? Well, uh, you never know. I mean, they're not going to suddenly bomb Israel. Maybe not. But they're going to begin to expand because they have now an argument. They have nuclear power. And to then to thwart Iran's political expansion into the region in uh, Iraq and also Syria and Hezbollah begins to make a threat at Israel. In other words, the attacks will commence from many nations in this case, not just Iran. It's the unity of Islamic nations. We're not talking about nuclear, uh, sorry, terrorist organizations in this case. We're talking about terrorist states in this case. So even with the, with the so-called moderates of Turkey, you look at Turkey itself, they've, they're a major threat to Israel, and the Azidi connection, they could also unite with the Shia. So you have an Islamic belt right around Israel. And, of course, the issue of Jerusalem, talking about peace talks, carries pressuring Israel all the time 
to do away with settlements and so on and so forth, threatening Israel. And to give up half of Jerusalem. And this is when Iran is under severe pressure. I urge Secretary Kerry not to rush to sign, to wait, to reconsider, to get a good deal. But this is a bad deal, a very, very bad deal. It's the deal of the century for Iran. It's a very dangerous and bad deal. I still get chills up my spine when I listen to Bob Dylan singing this song. The times certainly are a-changing. There's John Kerry, who's gone from a swift boat to a swift kick in the behind of a Netanyahu. Many of you uh, say it's long overdue. The left hates Israel. The left would like Israel to disappear. Uh, and the left is probably cheering that Valerie Jarrett's uh, White House was secretly negotiating with Iran behind the back of not only uh, Israel, but behind the back of our own Congress. A Daily Beast investigation was reported today that the U.S. was lifting financial pressure on Iran going back to June and in, re in return getting nothing. So this is your Kerry, this is your Obama. The question tonight is, well, there are many questions, mainly how do you feel about <laughs> Obama and Kerry stabbing uh, I Israel in the back. But, you know, there's a, another way to look at this, and many people probably look at it that way. They're so tired, at the end of the day, struggling with their own personal demons, their own personal lives, their finances, their children, their parents, their mother, their father, existence itself, that they could care less about Israel. Israel is now so far removed from the psyche of most Americans. It's not what it was 20 or 30 years ago. Why? There's a number of reasons. One, we have a more narcissistic, uh, uh, not president, that, that's a given. We have a more self-centered uh, electorate in America than any in history. The baby boomer generation could care less about Israel. They care about health care, free prescription drugs, uh, and Viagra. That's what they care about. They're focused not on the pebble and the shoe, but on uh, something else. As uh, the great Roman historian said, the average Roman in his time didn't care about where the legions were, or whether they were winning or losing. They cared about the pebble and the shoe. And today the average senior liberal in particular cares only about not the pebble and the shoe, but the Viagra in his medicine cabinet. And so although that sounds clever, the question is, where do we go with this cat and mouse game now? Is Israel really going to disappear <clears throat> if Iran gets a nuclear weapon? That's one question. But the bigger issue really is, and this is what most Americans would say, how can we do anything about it? We don't have the military. We don't have the infrastructure. We don't have the money to be the world's policeman anymore. So really, you're acting as if, it's America of 40 years ago when it isn't. We've lost our edge. We've lost it. Obama has decimated the military. He fired three more, two more admirals tonight. He's cut out the combat leadership in the military. He has feminized and homosexualized the military. So where's the military that could do anything about this, even if we had a president who wanted to do it right now? He has gutted the military. Everybody knows that. Who knows what's going on inside the military? But put that aside. Where is this supposed to come from? Do we have the money to be the world's policemen? And should we be the world's policemen? Well, some would say yes. Others would say no. And that leaves us right now talking about how do you feel tonight if you heard it for the first time tonight, and I suppose you have because I know it wasn't on Fox News. I know it wasn't on uh, CNN or any of the other networks. So far as I know, they're talking about Obamacare probably. Uh, it's strange for me on Friday nights, I seem to have the most intense shows. With us now is someone who knows much more about the situation than I do. I've never met the man. He lives in hiding. He's a former member of the Muslim Brotherhood, previously a member of the Palestine Liberation Organization, was arrested for being a terrorist, was a Muslim at birth, converted to Christianity. His name is Walid Shubat. His book is The Case for Islamophobia. He can be found online at shubat.com. And he joins us again on the Savage Nation. Well, Lead, welcome back to the program. Thank you for me. Where would you like to go with the uh, situation right now, Well, Lead? What would you like to talk about? Well, I mean, you look at you brought up Pakistan. I mean, we talk about Iran building nuclear weapons. Pakistan is the number one source of jihadi suicide bombers. They're the ground zero for training of Islamist terrorists around the world. In fact, every terrorist attack that has to do for, with Pakistani terrorists has been uh, condemning Israel. And of course, the transfer of nuclear ability to North Korea by A.Q. Khan in the past, and in fact, 
even in 2003, you know, and, uh, it was exposed <clears throat> uh, that the, the by the by United States intelligence, Western intelligence, in the early 2000s, a ship was seized by the U.S. authorities on October October 2003. Route from Dubai to Libya found a contain, you know, contains 1,000 centrifuge components. In other words, it was being sent to Libya in the, in the early 2000s. And today, what do we have? We have on January 1st, 2013, Crown Prince Salman of Saudi Arabia, who's a deputy premier and defense minister, traveled to Islamabad, commissioned the Pakistani government to build nuclear weapons for you know, uh, multi-billion dollar fee and all that stuff. So now Saudi Arabia, which is a Wahhabi... Coming up on the next morning. And this was exposed by Amos Yaldin, who, you know, is Israeli military intelligence. So we know for a fact that now Saudi Arabia is going to begin to its own nuclear program. In the past, we've seen it with Libya. So now we don't even know in the future who next will have nuclear weapons. Could be Turkey, could be... You know, any any country in the Middle East, the Turks, of course, they're going to stand by seeing the Saudis armed. Uh, Turkey is the number one military uh, power in the region, you know, and of course it presents a threat to Israel. It's an Islamist government. Let's not forget the Ak Party is Islamist. But they make beautiful yachts in Turkey. They still have many Americans buy Turkish Turkish built yachts. They make beautiful yachts. You know, that's a strange statement, but it's, oh, what, you know, it was the first nation their own weapons? To, uh, no, I'm saying, yeah, and weapons, but I'm saying Turkey was the first nation to grant women the right to vote. You know that better than I do. Right. And uh, it's a strange paradox what Turkey has become under Erzakan, Erdogan, which where it's moving backwards into the, some Islamist uh, uh, past when it had been such a, almost a light in the Muslim world. Wouldn't you say it was a light in the Muslim world for so long? That is correct, but it's the elephant in the room that is playing the card with the Turkish model that is secular Islam, it's more moderate form than the Muslim Brotherhood, than Al-Qaeda, than all these other infrastructures. So now it's kind of becoming the model, and it's, of course it's an ally of the United States, it's part of NATO. You know, the armies of Turkey can move into Europe in the future. It can defeat France, Germany, and England combined with its military. So we have a huge power in the Middle East that is... Yeah, I want to remind people that Turkey has always had a powerful... Uh, military. In fact, Winston Churchill uh, was a commander, and he lost a battle at Gallipoli, where so many thousands of young British, New Zealanders, and Australians were slaughtered by the Turks, because it was a disastrous mistake on the part of Winston Churchill in his early years. So Gallipoli is all about the, the power of the Turkish military, even then. But l I don't want to get distracted here from the issue at hand, Waleed, because this is disturbing to some and frankly means nothing to others. Let, let me ask an, uh, an esoteric question. We both agreed in the last hour that Israel basically will do nothing. We both agreed on that, correct? That's correct. Okay. So Iran now becomes a nuclear power. Iran's not going to just categorically drop a nuclear weapon on Tel Aviv, and Tel Aviv's not going to drop a nuclear weapon on Tehran. Okay, so the world goes on and people say, so what, big deal. What is the big deal? Well, the big deal is in the negotiating powerhouse, you know, when it has nuclear, uh, the ability for Israel or the United States to attack it will become very diminished. It begins to expand its Islamist ideology. It, it, it has control over Hamas. It has control over Hezbollah. It has control over Syria. It's having control over Iraq. It's begin it, it wants to destroy Saudi Arabia. It has a problem with Saudi Arabia, which begins, uh, uh, you know, uh, basically uh, that the Sunni alliances would have to face with Iran or even unite with Iran. And, of course, the one who's going to suffer the most is the state of Israel and the Christians. You look at even in Syria, the situation of the Christians under the Islamists, you have in the... Yeah, what's going on, what's going on with the Christians in Syria? They're protected by Assad. And, of course, McCain and Lindsey Graham wanted to destroy Assad, which would have led to the decimation of the Syrian Christian community. How did that, how did that come about? <laughs> well, I mean, currently you talk about the Christians in Syria. You know, you have 40, the largest massacre happened in recent history. Forty-five Christians slaughtered in the village of Sadad by Muslim fanatics, by Muslim Brotherhood operatives. 
in which you have, uh, you know, lately 1,500 families were taken hostage by the Islamist rebels. In fact, you know, look, wait a minute. These are the same rebels that that Obama wants to give weapons to and is giving weapons to, and the CIA is training. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, the United States government currently is standing with the Islamists. Where is the war on terror? This is my argument. Anybody who says we have a war on terror needs to answer what are we doing in Syria, needs to answer why are we ousting Husni Mubarak in place, Husni, uh, in, in placing uh, the Muslim Brotherhood, Mohammed Mursi. And why well, even the Egyptian people wouldn't stand for it. They told McCain to go to hell and go home when he came there and tried to tell them how to run their affairs. But the Syrian Christian community is protected by Assad, is it not? Absolutely. They love uh, Bashar al-Assad. They want him to remain in power. But of course, still, you know, the government of Syria is anti-Israel. But by far, this is much better still yet than the Muslim Brotherhood, the, the, the second largest, you know, basically uh, power peg of the Muslim Brotherhood is in Syria. If you recall historically, it was the father of Bashar al-Assad, Hafiz al-Assad, who annihilated the Muslim Brotherhood. In in, of, and didn't he do it in, ha, in, ha, in Hamas? I'm sorry, in that in the city, the, in the northern city of, was it Ham, Hamas? How do you say it in Arabic, the city that he killed 40,000 uh, Muslims in? I, I think it's Hama. Uh, Hama. Uh, I always mix it up, right? It's Hama. He killed, yes. killed 40,000 people. Was that 30 years ago? I was stunned by that. That was Assad's father. That's correct, but the West doesn't understand the Middle East, even under, uh, under uh, Saddam Hussein. That's how he dealt with the Islamists. You just basically annihilate them. Uh, this is how the Egyptians dealt with the Muslim Brotherhood. Any leader comes up, uh, you have Gamal Abdel Nasser, hang him on the gallows. You know, this is what happened to Sayyid Qutb. That's how you deal with the Islamists in the Middle East. But of course, Americans want democracy in the Middle East. And by Oh, yes, they love democracy, don't they? Except here in America, where they trick every election... They rig every election. They flood the polls with illegal aliens. It's unbelievable to me how they can talk out of one side of their mouth about democracy in the Middle East and practice a form of Chicago daily politics that's unheard of in the rest of the world. But, um, you know, I have callers on the line right now, on the, on the program right now, Waleed, that are, are wanting to say a few things. Hold on one minute. Waleed, stay with us. Waleed Shubat has to hear some of this, and then we're going to ask some questions. These are great callers. Andre, on KSFO in San Francisco, go ahead, please. Uh, good evening, Dr. Savage. It's a pleasure to speak to you. I've been a listener for over 12 years, and it's really an honor to connect with you tonight. Um, I know you're a, a fan of logic and a practitioner of logic, and I just wanted to put forward uh, this bit of logic. Iran does not need nuclear weapons for self-defense. That we know. And secondly... Um, if Iran has nuclear weapons, then that the purpose of them having the nuclear weapons is not for self-defense. Therefore, their need for nuclear weapons is to abolish or destroy some other nation. And uh, I think that that bit of logic in itself should should uh, basically make it uh, obscene but, that they. But would... Andre, did you vote for Barack Obama? Absolutely not. Are you kidding me? I know. I don't know. Some people were hoodwinked. They thought he was a wonderful, peace-loving man. Well, I thank you for that call. Another caller is saying, James from Mississippi. James, go ahead. You're up on the Savage Nation. Quickly, go ahead, please. Yes, Michael. I was wondering why Red China hasn't said anything about, you know, Iran wanting to uh, get the nuclear bomb right on their doorstep and ready to spread their poison into Red China. Why is China not concerned about Iran getting a nuke is the question. Waleed, any answer to that? We'll take Waleed's answer when we, when we return about why is China not concerned about Iran getting a nuclear weapon. I can answer that one, and I'm no expert. I'll be right back. The shocker tonight is that Obama and Kerry secretly lifted Iran sanctions months ago. They've given Iran the deal of the century. Iran is behind most of the terrorist attacks that our boys have been facing for years now. They've killed our soldiers, maimed our soldiers, blinded our soldiers. And here we have an administration doing a deal with the devil. And I've asked you how you feel about that. Waleed Shubat, you've got the last word tonight on the Savage Nation. Go ahead, please. What would you like to say to the audience? Well, I mean, in the last question about China, I think China has immense deals with Iran, the North Pars natural field, since 2006. Of course, they, 
you know, the deal with the imports of 3 million tons of liquefied natural gas annually from Iran. So we're talking about deals and things of that sort that goes on. Of course, you have nuclear deals between Pakistan and Saudi Arabia, which basically we're looking at a Middle East with nuclear power peg, which when it becomes nuclear power peg, and of course Pakistan, even under Bhutto, talked about the Islamic bomb. Let's not forget what it's called, the Islamic bomb. That is a nuclear bomb. And we have, you know, 100 nuclear in Pakistan with the, you know, with the United States basically aiding and abetting the terror infrastructure in which the jihadis and the Islamic revolution is taking place. In is that why Obama is purging the generals and the admirals? I mean, something's wrong with this picture from those of us who understand about the purge and the military. There goes the world. Deborah is calling us. Welcome to the program. Ezra, where are you calling from, Deborah? I'm calling from Tel Aviv, Israel. Good evening, Dr. Savage. <laughs> oh, shalom from Tel Aviv, Israel. You're listening on the Internet, I suppose. How do you feel tonight knowing that the American president did this? Uh, well, who can, who can sleep with all these tours? But I, I wanted to not overlook the connection. This is also the weekend of the anniversary of the 80th anniversary of Kristallnacht. You're kidding. It was this weekend that the Nazis burned the synagogues in Berlin? Yes, sir, in, in Austria and Germany. And uh, so basically it's a subliminal, I believe, a subliminal message to Israel basically saying, <laughs> I'll say it nicely, go jump in the lake. Well, what's the mood in Israel today, Deborah? Obviously the news has been out for the whole day. Have you heard people talking about it? What are they saying? Uh, the American Jews are quite livid, uh, but uh, they don't put it past them. But uh, we're, it's still so bad that we're, we're quite shocked. Mm. Well, good luck. I don't know what else to say, and God bless you, and may God be with you. Let's pray that the Bible is not as predictive as we sometimes think it is, because if you look at the... I, I don't want to do the Bible <laughs> preaching right now, but I can't help it. Because I've seen passages in the Bible that are so frightening that predict nuclear war, and I've read them on the air. I don't want to read them now to scare people, but it talks about, I wish to God I could put my fingers on this now, but I've reached a point with my Old Testament in English where there are so many post-its, they're meaningless because they cover each other. It started with a few post-its 20 years ago. Now there's a post-it on every page, so there's no point to it. But I'm flipping through the post-its anyway because there is a piece in the Old Testament where the Bible literally talks about the, the aftermath of a nuclear war in a way that's clear to anyone who knows what an aftermath of nuclear war looks like, which any educated American or, frankly, any individual who's ever watched the pictures of Hiroshima and Nagasaki and what the people looked like where they had turned to ash and they looked as though they were covered in ash it is in the Bible, and I don't have it. I do see Isaiah where it says, For though thy people, O Israel, be as the sand of the sea, only a remnant of them shall return, which was, of course, the creation of the state of Israel in 1947. And then Isaiah says, An extermination is determined overflowing with righteousness. I have no idea who he was predicting would be exterminated. I have no idea. And they that harass Judah shall be cut off. And uh, we don't know where this goes. Therefore, I'll make the heavens to tremble, and the earth shall be shaken out of her place for the wrath of the Lord of hosts and for the day of his fierce anger. Now, there are many fundamentalist Christians who are listening to this program who believe the Bible is the word of God and the truest word of God and the truest words there are. And they understand that. And they believe that they will, have, they will have the end of days, that we've been in them for a long time. Many of them believe that Obama ushered in the end of the end of days. Now, I'm, not, I'm not in that camp, in that I'm a rationalist. I'm not that much of a religionist. But I often read the Bible somewhat as poetry, somewhat as out of historic interest. But sometimes I fall upon passages that shock me. And, and uh, tonight could be one of them. Because if I read to you, which I may do at the end of the show tonight, after this quick break, the predictions of what could happen with the blink of, in the blink of an eye. We don't know what could happen. 
We don't know what Israel might do. We don't know what Israel might do now that they see the viper and the serpent and what the viper and the serpent have done to them. I'll be right back. Join the Savage Nation. Call now, 855-400-SAVAGE, 855-400-7282. Savage. If you search the Bible, I found it. I found it. But first I want to read something before it from Joel where he says, And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your old men shall dream dreams. Your young men shall see visions. I remember that one because I read that when I was very young. Would that make me a young man? Because I'm certainly not an old man dreaming dreams, am I? I feel like a young man who is prophesizing. Or, or, or am I a young man who is seeing visions? In either case, it's in the Bible. And it explains the behavior of age groups. Now, many times I've talked about the liberal statement of turn your swords into plowshares, and I've read it to you, correct? Did you know that in Joel... It is written, beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weak say, I am strong. Why did he say that? Because Joel said, proclaim this among the nations, prepare war, stir up the mighty men. Let all the men of war draw near. Let them come up. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. It is the opposite of the liberal gibberish that the churches have put into the minds of the weakling Christians in America who have turned the other cheek for so long there are no longer any cheeks to turn. Remember that your Bible is based upon the Old Testament, which is anything but an anemic, pacifist document. Maybe it's time for you to find these passages for your feminized pastors. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weak say, I am strong. Maybe they wouldn't need Prozac if they had a priest putting some fiber into their spines. But now let me get to where I'm going before the time is up tonight on the Savage Nation. It was found, the nuclear symptoms. Zechariah, is it prophecy, madness, or nothing? And this shall be the plague wherewith the Lord will smite all the people that have warred against Jerusalem. Their flesh shall consume away while they stand upon their feet, and their eyes shall consume away in their sockets, and their tongue shall consume away in their mouths. And it shall come to pass in that day that a great tumult from the Lord shall be among them. And they shall lay hold every one on the hand of his neighbor, and his hand shall rise up against the hand of his neighbor. And Judah also shall fight against Jerusalem. And the wealth of all the nations round about shall be gathered together. So there it is. That is the plague. All the peoples that have warred against Jerusalem, read the Bible. Their flesh shall consume away while they stand upon their feet, and their eyes shall consume away in their sockets, and their tongue shall consume away in their mouth. Laugh if you will, Harvey. It's not a movie. It's not Charlton Heston's script as he goes out with the cue boards, Harvey. It's the real McCoy, and it was written by the greatest screenwriter the world has ever ever read. He's written a screenplay that the world has been reading for thousands of years, Harvey. It's something you can't find in the motels of Brentwood. No, my friends, it's the real McCoy. Am I calling for it? No, I'm just reading it to you. I'm just reading it to you.